The future of epigenetics. You know, it, it occurs to me that since epigenetics is a cutting edge science that governs the expression of genes over time. You know, we have genes in our body, they're the same in every cell in our body. So the reason that our eye cells are different than our muscle cells are different than our bone cells is because the epigenetic code turns on and turns off different parts of our code so that different parts are expressed. As I'm sure you guys know as well, I know for a fact that um, another big part of the epigenetics is that it changes over time. It's a, it changes as a function of age, it changes as a function of your behaviors, it changes as a function of your medical condition. And because of this, all kinds of fascinating things are being done. The number of things that can be discovered with epigenetics is veritably exploding in terms of coming up with your biological age and what diseases you might have and what behaviors you're undertaking and its uses in insurance, blah, 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 all this stuff that we know and love and talk about. Um, but as a result, the science is advancing rapidly and it's, it's becoming a, a central part of our quest to live you know, longer, healthier lives. Um, as we do this, it's occurred to me, and this is just me thinking openly around what's likely to happen as the, as epigenetics evolves as a science. You know, we three have been working on this for quite some time right now. Um, but, but it occurs to me that, that, that there's four distinct steps that we might well go through with epigenetics. The first is the one that we are absolutely focused on right now, which is coming up with more and better predictors. Things like biological age. What's the best predictor? Is it pheno age? Is it grim age? Is it all that? And every year at least, something new and better comes out. But it's more than that. It's not just biological age. It's the range of behaviors that can be predicted. There's smoking, there's drinking, there's, um, the, the, there's um, exercise, there's sleep, there's all kinds of different things that you can discover on the behavioral side. And of course, on the medical side, the range of medical conditions that can be predicted based on epigenetics is growing dramatically as well. So, it seems to me pretty obvious that the first step is exactly doing what we're doing, more and better predictors. And that's, I think, quite firmly where we are now. But importantly, all of those things are about just explaining the risk, if you will, explaining what we think is out there. It's not actually working to extend our health or improve our health. It's just measuring what is. And so that leads to the second step, which is identifying which interventions actually do the best job of indicating which, um, of helping us to live longer. So we're all trying to live longer, but we don't really know which of those interventions do the best job. We're trying to, is it diet for me, or is it sleeping better, is it meditation, is it cold baths, all that sort of stuff. We're all trying to live longer, but it's kind of like dieting without a scale, and we don't know how well we're doing. So I think, again, first step is more and better predictors. The second step is actually identifying optimal interventions for individuals, and that's helping us to live longer. Then I think there's a third step, which is once these predictors get so solid that we've got clinical validity around them, then they can be used for precision medicine in an extremely important way to empower specific medical interventions, not just behavioral interventions. But because appropriately it's going to take longer to gain that level of proof, that's probably a step further out than just finding which behavioral interventions we're doing. So step three would then be the, the precision medicine piece of this. And then finally, the one that Raymond and I and Matten, we all like to talk about most is epigenetic reprogramming. To the extent that aging is caused by a loss of epigenetic signature, if we can, and increasingly, yes, we can, reprogram the epigenome of our cells to go back to you know, the way it was, if we can reset epigenetic signatures, there might be some possibility of truly resetting our, our biological age and living much, much longer. So I apologize for being so long here, but I really wanted to do is kind of get this idea out there. Four steps, again, um, more and better predictors, um, better interventions for in, and customized to individuals, precision medicine, and then epigenetic engineering. And it seems to me that we have to go through those phases 
and they may not be exactly sequential. Some of them will overlap a bit, but that's what it seems to me. But the reason I got you on, on, on this is I want to see whether you agree or disagree or have other ideas around how this science that we all care deeply about might well evolve. What do you guys think? I'm going to jump right in. I was going to say, we can make it super short by saying, man, I totally agree with you. That's exactly right. <laughs> We're done. Done. <laughs> I know you better than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I actually, I do like that framework. And I think that that's not just roughly right. I think that's absolutely right. I think the, the place where, of course, I'm going to poke at it is you're maybe understating the importance of at least three out of four of those. And, and I'll, I'll run through really uncharacteristically quick my, my bullet points. We're going to get better, faster, cheaper epigenetic tests. And that's great because that's going to drive uh, more researchers being able to access those, produce more findings. It's going to drive economies of scale where people are able to use this for more and more. We are going to be able, and I mean, sometimes us as a group, we're trying to apply this to insurance, how that works. And I think that that becomes an incredible source of a lot of really good, actionable in both a research and in a personal way of information. It's this huge virtuous circle where more testing produces more results, more testing also produces cheaper tests, and it just goes and feeds on itself. And mm -hmm. as just an example, this won't just be about so it will be about, I'm sorry, I'm going to go on for just a second. It will go, be go, about go. You're doing fine. Predicting death and things like that uh, or, or all-cause mortality or the, the, the possibility of somebody having a higher risk of some disease. And that's fantastic because the way we do studies now is like, let's follow this big group of people for 20 years and see who drops dead. And, you know, that, that's a good gold standard, but it would be nice to have something that is more like um, a, 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 a polygenic risk score for mortality, mm -hmm. right? And, and being able to say, oh yeah, your, your score went up. And so in aggregate, this group had worse scores, even though we've only followed them for a month. And we believe this enough where we think that that means group A did better than group B. And so we should do more of that drug and more of that exercise or whatever. So, so that's one thing. Another thing is, I think we're going to be able to use epigenetics, not just for, is this drug working? Is this intervention working? We'll be able to use it for some things. And this is a little spooky. Um, who is going to respond better to what stimulus? Meaning, if we yep. put out in front of a bunch of people, you ought to be jogging or you're going to die in, you know, two years earlier. Some people, having that presented to them a certain way, will be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And other people will jump on it immediately. I've got a friend who just got a bad um, heart scan, and I've been trying to get him to get a heart scan for 10 years. And he jumped on it, and now all of a sudden he's like, I'm going to lose weight and do this and do that. And I'm like, man, this mm -hmm. didn't change anything. But now that you got bad information, you're motivated by that. So we'll be mm -hmm. able to actually put people in groups and say people are motivated by this and that. And and let me go on. Let me at least touch on the the, the two other things that I'm thinking. I think mm -hmm. um, this is going to be a bigger and bigger deal because it will touch a lot of lives, not just because of the virtuous circle and more people having access, but people will be able to make informed decisions. And this dovetails with the whole sort of AI revolution, machine learning revolution that's going on right now, because this will be such complex information, not just people or populations in the world and separate ones behaving differently, but an individual person under a different set of circumstances and the tissues in their body behaving differently. We're going to need really good tools to keep up with it. And then the final thing is when we talk about epigenetic engineering, and I think you very appropriately say, once we do this and we have this information and there's more things where people are doing it and it's applied, not just on a wellness standard, but a precision medicine standard and going out, um, I think there's a possibility for that to actually leapfrog. There's some really interesting studies and experiments being done. People are starting to say, what would happen if, you know, if we treat epigenetics as an odometer 
and we can turn back the odometer of the car. It's not just what miles you've got on you, but if we turn back the odometer, and, and you've heard me use this analogy before, it's like yeah. Christine in a Stephen King novel, all the dents pop out, the paint looks good, the engine starts purring. So it's, it's not just correlated, but causative. It's not just causative, but reversible. And mm -hmm. we can go ahead and do it. And I think, like, I'm really interested to see, and I've been trying to follow, are there people who are looking at specific epigenetic markers for a rare disease where they could do something about it and treat it? And then that kind of manipulation, if we find more markers that are representative of some sort of aging in general and are also accessible in a tissue, we might end up with something that looks a little unlikely, like some sort of fountain of youth pill. And I don't mean for everything, everybody all the time in the next couple of years, but I mean something where it puts us on a path where we see a lot of investment and work on this. So, so I ran mm -hmm. on. But no, no, I think you covered every category and ending with the epigenetic engineering piece you just discussed. Maten, do you dare to wade into these waters? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Raymond did a really good job summarizing a full soup to nuts part of the process. We take this paradigm that I think Raymond very eloquently laid out from epigenetic differences, features to possibilities of what can be engineered and interspersed in this is interventions that can happen. Ultimately, the combination can and will lead towards precision medicine and personalized uh, therapies, so to speak. But we have to be mindful of this linear process, which has a lot of streams going along the way that will that expand, has to be at a much, much larger scale and a much more depth in terms of data for us to get really strong, absolutely perfect, backed by science patterns. This is not to say that let's wait until that happens and we can't do anything else. No, of course, there are stop milestones along the way where we learn that, OK, certain parameters, certain markers seem to exist in a set of people or populations that we study where uh, in some particular kind of exposure to, let's say, uh, a certain kind of alcohol or smoke, certain parameters change. We can measure those and those correlations exist. So that is information to learn from. But there's more to be done. And I uh, I think it's it's almost like a, a squeaky wheel in our discussions. I keep talking about we need more data, we need we need more samples, and we need to go deep. <laughs> that's your it's, job. That's your job. Yes. And it's in part no, because that's, that's, great. that's the best way to get it. Yes. Guys, well, thank you. Thank you, first of all, for, for allowing me to talk so long at the beginning and laying out the, the, this notion that epigenetics will evolve through four stages. I think we've talked about those stages. Again, the stages are more and better predictors. Two, then optimal interventions for individuals actually helping people to live longer. Then we move over to precision medicine. And then ultimately, perhaps, this one's the furthest out, of, of course, so it's hardest to predict exactly when, would be some epigenetic re-engineering, potentially allowing us to live much longer. What I, what I think I heard your responses, and I'm checking now, but, but what, I, what I think I heard your responses as is, Raymond, you are largely like, yeah, that, it, it generally seems right that those are the phases we'll go through, but don't shortchange those first three phases. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen that's going to be really interesting, and we'll probably discover even more about that. And Maten, in addition to agreeing with all of that, you did add the important point. You know, take it with the take it with a grain of salt here. I mean, we've got to get more data. It's an early science. We're just learning what we're doing, but there really could well be some fantastic things ahead. And I think this is me speaking, not you. I mean, personally, I think we have kind of a duty to kind of predict or think through. Well, how is this going to evolve? What phases will epigenetics go through? And I appreciate you both wading into these somewhat troubled waters uh, with me in the conversation today. Thank you very much.